Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Homage to the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the Supremely Enlightened One. Homage to the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the Supremely Enlightened One. Homage to the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the Supremely Enlightened One, Sadhu, 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 and Buddha. So today for our um, Dhamma talk, I'd like to teach a nice sutta from the Majjhima Maybe some of you have heard this before. It's a very popular discourse. The Vatupama Sutta, the simile of the cloth. The Buddha gives a really striking simile in this discourse about the mind, about our minds. So if you'd like to follow along, this is Majjhima number seven. Yes, uh, Dinil sent a message to everyone so you can follow along with the discourse. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's Park. There he addressed the monks thus, monks, venerable sir, they replied. The Blessed One said this, Monks, suppose a cloth were defiled and stained, and a dyer dipped it in some dye or other, whether blue or yellow or red or carmine. So there's a dirty cloth, it's stained, and this dyer, so an Indian those days, that was a kind of profession, actually, people who dyed cloth. So things are done um, industrially now. But in those days, people would use natural dyes, and it was a person's job to dye cloth. So after bringing this dirty cloth to a dyer, someone who dyes cloth, he would dip it into one of various colors, either blue, yellow, red, or carmine. It would look poorly dyed and impure in color. Why is that? Because of the impurity of the cloth. This is where the discourse gets its name, the simile of the cloth. So too, when the mind is defiled, an unhappy destination may be expected. So the Buddha is comparing our mind here to a dirty cloth a cloth that has stains, is dirty, defiled. It doesn't take dye well. You can't dye that cloth to have an even, beautiful color. And in the same way, when the mind is dirty, when the mind is defiled, then after this life, when a person is reborn in the next world, an unhappy destination is expected. Unhappy destination means one of the four bad destinations, right? Either rebirth in hell, the animal world, the ghost world, or the asura world. And so what is the cause for that, that bad rebirth? Here the Buddha explains the defiled mind defilements of the mind. So here we can see in this actual, in this short simile, the Buddha is here explaining the noble truth of suffering, to be reborn in one of the bad destinations, right? And the noble truth of the origin of suffering. What is that? The defiled mind, defilements of the mind. Now the Buddha is going to describe the we could say, the third and fourth noble truths. Monks, suppose a cloth were pure and bright, 
and a dyer dipped it in some dye or other, whether blue or yellow or red or carmine, it would look well dyed and pure in color. Why is that? Because of the purity of the cloth. So here the Buddha gives the converse in the simile. You take a brand new, clean white cloth, and you'd go and dye that cloth. That cloth would be evenly dyed, would take the dye very well, look beautiful afterward, right? Because it's a clean cloth, clean white cloth. So in the same way, when the mind is undefiled, a happy destination may be expected. So by removing the defilements of the mind, that is when the mind is not defiled, dirty, dirtied by the defilements, then after death, beings are reborn in good destinations, in the human world or the heavenly world. So here we see, like we said, the noble truth of suffering, noble truth of the origin of suffering, the defilements of mind, the noble truth of the cessation of suffering, removing those defilements of mind, removing that very cause for suffering, right? And so what is the the path leading to the cessation of suffering is that way to remove defilements of mind, right? So the Buddha explains mental defilements as the cause of suffering. So to remove them, firstly, it's possible to remove them. That is important. Um, the, the famous psychologist, Sigmund Freud, he believed... Um, Human emotions were instincts that can't be removed. So he, he thought the idea like desire, greed, it can't be removed from the mind. He thought it's a characteristic of the mind, an innate characteristic of the mind. But in the Buddha's teaching, it's not true. So the Buddha himself destroyed all greed, right? Destroyed all defilements of mind. And then he taught all of his disciples how to do the same. So in this discourse, we'll learn what's very important about this discourse, actually. Uh, maybe the most important thing is that the Buddha here explains in detail different defilements of mind. Upakilesa in Pali. So when the mind is defiled, beings are reborn in bad destinations after death. When the mind is pure, undefiled, then beings are reborn in good destinations after death. So what is the most important thing that determines our fate after this life? Defilements of the mind. And beings with defiled minds engage in misconduct by body, speech, and mind. We'll learn more about that in a minute. So what monks are the imperfections that defile the mind? Or we could say simply, what are the defilements of mind? What are mental defilements? Covetousness and unrighteous greed is an imperfection that defiles the mind. So some of these words, I'm going to change the translation a little bit to, I think, bring out more of the meaning. So covetousness, and the other word is visamaloba. Visamaloba is, we could say, I think, rapacious greed or excessive greed. So covetousness is desire for other people's belongings. So we live together with other people in this world, right? And other people own things. They have property in terms of the, um, conventionally speaking, right? They have property, they own possessions. So to desire the possessions of others is covetousness. That is a defilement of mind, Buddha explains. So how does this happen in, in practice, right? So in the Buddha's time, the 
some governments were organized in like um, monarchical systems, right? There was a king ruling the country and he had supreme sovereignty in the country. And in not just ancient Indian history and in Roman history, the same thing happened, but sons who were heir to the throne would kill their fathers, right? The king, so that they would become king. So what is that? That's desire for the possessions of others. So the prince desires to be king. He desires to possess what his father possesses. And because he is impatient also, if he was patient, he could avoid um, parasite and the anantarika papa karma, the, um, one of the five heinous deeds that a person can do, killing one's father. So if he was patient, if he removed this defilement of mind, covetousness, then he could avoid that evil deed. So where does that evil deed begin? In the mind. So with this mental defilement, defiled by this mental defilement, that prince engages in some action by body, right? Maybe he says something with his, he uses speech, right? And when the mind is defiled, the bodily actions, the verbal actions, the, the words we say, they are also tinged by that defilement. If the defilement is the basis for that action, right? And then the second defilement, here is explained, visamaloba, or just to understand clearly, I think, it's very simply, excessive greed. So, in the world, in human society, in cultures of various countries, Greed is a normal thing, right? It was normal for human beings to experience greed, to desire things. So in accordance with that normality, society, different cultures, even um, the law in various countries has determined this amount of greed, this kind of greed is socially acceptable. Now think for yourself how, maybe an example of that. So a, a simple example is, uh, I think, um, marriage. So marriage is a socially acceptable practice. Most people in the world get married. But there's a, based on that, so people enter into a, relationship with another, a partnership, a marriage, because of desire, right? So that, so marriage, the state of marriage, is based on some kind of desire, but it's socially acceptable. So it's, it's allowed, even encouraged, right, to get married in society. But to become married, getting married, is based on desire. Based on desire for the opposite sex, right? Based on sexual desire. So it, it's, that state of mind is defiled to some degree, but it's acceptable in society to get married, even encouraged. So there's, <clears throat> we can say, like a, a convention, a certain amount, of greed, desire, that's socially acceptable. But let's think about this. So it's acceptable to get married in society, encouraged to get married in society. Now, what about to have five partners? So it's acceptable to have one, right? To get married to a wife or a husband. But is it acceptable in society to have five wives? To have five husbands? Ten? No, right? <laughs> so polygamy is not acceptable in society. Or these days there's a, a new concept, maybe not a new concept, but there's a word for it, 
Maybe you've heard open relationships, such a thing. That's where people, so they agree to be in a relationship, but there's no limit on their partners. So they're not committed to just one person. Now, in, as I understand in normal society, that's not acceptable. That goes beyond the convention of greed. So it's conventionally acceptable to have one husband or wife, one partner, but to have many partners in a sexual relationship without limits, that's not acceptable in society. So that would fall under here, excessive greed, right? Another example we could think of in terms of like material possessions. So the normal person has a house or an apartment, right? The normal person who's living a, a lay life. But to start to accumulate many different kinds of property, to own five homes, ten homes in different parts of the world, different parts of the country, that goes beyond the normal convention of greed, right? So some very wealthy people do this, but as based on a defiled state of mind, so we can understand just very simply to go beyond the conventions of greed in society, in our culture, is a defilement of mind. Now, the second, the Buddha actually groups these as one, as one word in Pali, abhijja visamaloba. The second one, the Buddha explains, ill will. I think we're, we're all like, familiar with ill will, I think. So, Ill will, we probably all know, is one of the five hindrances that prevent us from developing our mind, prevent us from practicing meditation. They, the five hindrances weaken our wisdom. They make it difficult to see things as they really are, to see the reality. So we can reflect on our experience when we are angry, when we're harboring ill will, towards another person, towards some circumstances, it's difficult to understand what's really happening. Our mind is clouded by that ill will. That is also defilement of mind, bearing ill will toward another person. Now it's one thing to mention, very important to understand. So a person who, who has never heard the Dhamma, who doesn't know the Buddha's teachings, they would normally think in this way, right? That they experience suffering because of other people. Because of other people's actions. Because of external circumstances. Because of the government. Because of political systems. That's how a normal person thinks, right? And if you look in human history, what has happened, just two glaring examples in Russia and China, the communist revolution that resulted in the deaths of millions of people. So the basis for that was that this human suffering that we're experiencing, this existential suffering, it's caused by the political system. That was the idea, right? Behind Stalin's communist revolution behind Mao Zedong's communist revolution. But what does the Buddha explain? The Buddha's teaching is very different, right? The Buddha explains that the cause of suffering is an internal thing. It arises in our own mind. It's very profound, actually. And it takes maturity, wisdom, to even accept that. Why? Because to accept that means to take responsibility for one's own life. You can't blame other people anymore. Once you learn this in the Buddha's teaching, right? You can't blame other people for your suffering. <laughs> because that's wrong, actually. That's not the reality. 
cause of suffering is an internal thing, it arises in our own mind. So we can understand in this discourse, the Buddha is explaining these defilements of the mind that cause suffering for us. And when these defilements of mind are expressed, bodily, verbal actions, they result in suffering for other people at large, right? So if countries adopt mm, policies based on these defilements, as going to lead to suffering for people. The third defilement the Buddha explains is anger. So anger is an imperfection that defiles the mind. When a person is overcome by anger, overwhelmed by anger, they think thoughts for their own affliction, for their own harm. What they think leads to other people's harm. And when they engage in any bodily action or verbal action, the speech they, the words they say, if that's based on anger, all that is unwholesome. All that leads to suffering. All that acquires bad karma. So anger is also a defilement of mind. Then the next defilement, Pali is upanaha, here it's translated in resentment. Another way we can understand it is, two other words we could use, malice or hostility. So this is um, anger that like, persists over time. We could think simply holding a grudge against a person is a clear manifestation of this defilement. So when you hold a grudge against a person, it's not just one instance of anger that arises, right? You prolong that anger. Maybe whenever you see that person, you get upset. You recollect something they did that you perceive as harmful to oneself. So it's, it's like sustained anger toward a person. I like the word malice or hostility. It conveys a good meaning, I think. That's also a defilement of mind, an imperfection of mind. And after we learn all these, I'll try to explain. So multiple defilements can be at work in our lives at like the same time, not just one. The next defilement is in Pali, Makkha. Here's translated to contempt. Another way you could understand it. Um, what is the, the word I prefer? Denigration gives a good meaning, but we should understand what is really meant here. So in Pali, or actually in singular, maybe some of you know, the translation for this word is gunamakukama, which means to like to erase qualities, to erase a person's qualities. So this is, I think, uh, maybe easiest to understand in terms of the, um, the monastery. So the monks and the lay people who are associated with the Toronto monastery, all of them have some amount of good qualities, right? Every one of them to participate in the monastery, to engage in the activities, to learn the Buddha's teachings. All of those activities are wholesome, right? They all require some amount of good qualities, some amount of good internal qualities. So, however, monks, the laity, laymen and laywomen, they also have faults, right? So until a person is an, an arahant, they have faults. So what happens with this defilement of mind, you see the faults of a person and you focus just on those faults and like cover the good qualities that a person has. And single, it means to erase them. Take an eraser and erase the good qualities. 
So you don't see them really. So I think this defilement we can say is based on delusion in part. Why? Because you don't actually see the good qualities in a person, right? They're there, but we don't see them. We focus on the bad qualities instead. The faults of a person. They maybe have 99 good qualities, but when the mind is defiled by this defilement, denigration, contempt, then we see the one fault, right? That's what it happens to us, right? So it's very, it's a very pitiful situation, really, right? When you think if there are 99 good qualities and we see the one bad one. So it, it reflects a, a narrow mind, right? Narrow mindedness. So we don't see the, the big picture. This person who has so many good qualities. They're very learned in the Buddha's teaching, very eager to learn the Buddha's teaching. Maybe they meditate every day. They give dana. But they say one, one uh, harsh word one day. And that's what we focus on. Not all of their good qualities, right? So this is um, contempt, denigration. I think when we use the English words, they convey more of like, a verbal action that a person performs, defiled by this defilement. But first, it's a mental defilement, right? So in the mind, we're focusing on the other person's faults. In the mind, we're erasing their good qualities, seeing their bad qualities instead. And then defiled by that state, maybe we might say something to another person, oh, so-and-so like is doing these unsuitable things, right? We don't speak about the good, the good things that they're doing, their good qualities. We speak about their faults like that, defiled by this state of mind. That's unwholesome. Now, it doesn't mean that um, we can't point out another person's faults. We can't discuss another person's faults, but we should do it very mindfully. And we should do it in the proper way. Otherwise, we can fall into this pitfall, this defilement. And then kind of a pair to this defilement, some of these defilements are organized in pairs, is insolence. Insolence, the Pali word is palasa. Insolence means, so there's a, another person has some good qualities, some very good qualities maybe. And in our mind, we compare ourselves with that person. Say another person is very, uh, they don't get angry easily. So they, they're normally, the normal state of mind is like divorced from anger. So they're dwelling in loving kindness. And let's say, for example, we get angry maybe fairly often. But we see that person and we see their good quality, their loving kindness, and maybe at that moment we're not particularly angry. And defiled by this defilement, insolence, a person thinks, oh, I also have a lot of loving kindness, like that person. I also dwell in loving kindness without anger most of the time. So this is also a defilement based on delusion, right? So you see another person's good qualities and qualities in yourself that you don't actually have, that are non-existent. You believe you compare yourself with another person who has those qualities. You believe you're on the same level as them. You understand? Some of these defilements take a a bit of explanation, I think, to actually understand what's being meant. So then, of course, this can also manifest itself in speech, right? And bodily actions. We believe ourselves to be as good as the other person, 
when the truth is actually otherwise. But we might, um, maybe a simple example, a person who deserves a promotion at work, who really has the, the qualities for that position, there's an opportunity to apply for promotion. And we really don't have the qualities that the position is looking for. That other person does. But we also apply for the job. We were allowed to apply for the job. Not, that's not the thing here. The point is, if, if our, in our mind we actually believe that we have these good qualities, we're deserving of the position as much as that other person, when the truth is otherwise, that's a defilement of mind. Internally, we are not as developed as that other person, but we think we are. Right? So that's an example of how things can play out in bodily actions, verbal actions, with this defilement. So maybe an example from the Buddha's time, Devadatta. So Devadatta thought he could become the Buddha. So he had the misunderstanding that Buddha is a, is a position, right? Not a realization. He thought Buddhahood is like a title that he could also get. So he compared himself with the Buddha. And that occasion when he took, I think it was 500 monks, and went to Gaia Hill. So Devadatta caused a schism in the Sangha. And when he was teaching the monks, he taught, like he mimicked the Buddha's behavior. He was like pretending to be the Buddha. So his behavior is based on this defilement, insolence. So Devadatta wasn't even a stream enter, but he's comparing himself with the Buddha. He's thinking he's as good as the Sama Sam Buddha. Right? So based on delusion. So these two are, are pairs in a way, this contempt and insolence. So to erase another person's good qualities and to like inflate one's own good qualities, they're like two sides of the same coin in a way. Right? Related. Next defilement is envy or jealousy. So jealousy means another person's success. Their we can think of it in terms of materially. We can think in terms of the Dhamma. So the, the good qualities that they develop by practicing the Buddha's teachings. And any material success they have, their wealth, right, success in their career. Jealousy is to not be able to bear another person's success. So one gets upset seeing how another person has succeeded. So this is very um, prevalent in society, I think. I remember when I was going to school, I think this was a, a huge driving force among the students in high school to see others that are succeeding and to not, to be unhappy actually about their success. I remember two students uh, were accepted to Ivy League schools. And I don't think people were really happy about that. <laughs> like they couldn't, they couldn't rejoice over the other people's success, right? And so not being able to rejoice over the other person's success this is how another defilement could come into play. So maybe insolence arises, right? Oh, I'm actually, I'm as smart as they are, really. But, you know, for some reason or another, I didn't get into that school. Or contempt arises. They maybe were accepted to such and such a school, but they have these and these faults, right? What is that? Contempt. Right? Erasing their good qualities. So this is how we get angry, right? Bear ill will, hold a grudge toward the person. 
So these are how multiple defilements can work together in our minds. And one of the most important things, learning all these, learning the qualities or the, like the characteristic of these defilements, we need to try and recognize them in our own lives. That's very important. If we don't recognize them, if we don't recognize the defiled state of mind as defiled, then how do we get rid of that? Right? If we don't have the opportunity, if we don't see it as unwholesome, we need mindfulness, we need wisdom to be able to understand these defilements, to see them as they arise. And then the, the other side of the same coin here for envy or jealousy is miserliness. They translated as avarice. So jealousy or envy is to not be able to bear another person's success, another person's development. But miserliness is to not share one's own success, one's own development with other people. So see how they're both based on success, the success of another person, our own success. To not bear another person's success, to get upset about that is jealousy. To like begrudge their the wealth that they have gained, the maybe the education they've obtained, the good qualities that they've developed by practicing the Dhamma. One begrudges that, one doesn't rejoice in that, one gets upset about that. And then miserliness means to not share one's own success with other people. Now, the English word miserliness, normally we think about that having like a material connotation. So the wealth that one has, one doesn't want to share it with other people. One doesn't want to give things, give material things, food, clothing to other people. That's miserliness, right? Now, very interestingly, so in, in the monastic life for a monk, a monk has very few material possessions, right? Very few things he actually owns. He has an alms bowl, robes, um, a, a bag, maybe, to carry around his possessions. So, miserliness in terms of material things, one could think that it doesn't really arise for a monk, right? But actually, the Buddha explains there are five different kinds of miserliness for a monk. Five different kinds. Not just about material things, interestingly. So we can understand the nature of this defilement by learning these. So the Buddha explained the five kinds of miserliness as labha matchariya, that is miserliness in terms of gains. So a monk may receive things from faithful lay people. He will receive alms food. He will receive robes, a place to dwell, and medicines, right? So say for some reason, maybe a meritorious monk receives much more than he needs of these. Maybe he receives, he receives robes very often, but at one time you can only wear one robe, right? But if he's defiled by this defilement, if his mind is defiled by miserliness, he doesn't want to share those robes with other monks. He maybe wants to keep them all to himself. Or he receives a nice uh, like cottage to dwell in. And maybe when he goes to another place, goes to live in another place, he locks it, takes the key, doesn't let anyone else stay there. He keeps that for himself. <laughs> He's not even living there at the moment. Went somewhere else. But he has miserliness for that dwelling. 
right? This can, miserliness in this way can rise toward all of the four requisites. Then another way miserliness can arise for a monk, kula matchariya, miserliness in relation to um, lay supporters. So in the Buddha's time, monks would go on alms round right to the village. So maybe a certain family becomes close with a monk, often supports him. And that monk, if they see another monk go to that house, they, he gets upset. Why? Because he has miserliness toward that family. It's maybe my family of supporters. Why are they going to visit my family of supporters? Right? This is another way miserliness can arise for a monk. Then, avasa uh, miseriness in regard to dwellings. So I explained a little bit about that. Another way that can arise is to not want, this happened in, I think maybe it's in the Dhammapada commentary or one of the Jataka stories about a monk who was living in a certain monastery and another monk came to stay there, not in the same kuti or anything, but another monk came to stay there and he didn't like the other monk being there. He, he wanted to control like who, who is allowed to live in the monastery. Why? Because he has miserliness toward that monastery. He doesn't want to share it with others. See, my monastery. Right? It, the, the file states of mind. But they can arise strongly toward monks even, as possible. Then another one, vannamacharya, miserliness in regard to praise. So this can happen for a layperson as well. When one receives praise for something good one has done, maybe, one gets hap one's happy about that, and one doesn't want to share praise with other people. So if another person gets praised for something, one can get upset about that. Only I should be praised is, is the idea the person. <laughs> Has, right? One Macharya, miserliness in regard to praise. Then uh, the last one for a monk, it's going to happen for a layperson too, actually, in fact, miserliness in regard to the Dhamma, which the Buddha considered as the most evil of all of these. Miserliness in regard to the Dhamma means a person knows the Buddha's teachings to some degree, they understand the Buddha's teachings to some degree, but they don't want to share what they know with other people. Right? That, that's very evil, right? So to actually, to know what is wholesome, what is unwholesome, to know how to live and how to conduct oneself so that one gains happiness in life, so that one um, practices for freedom from suffering, that's very powerful, very special knowledge. And a person who is overwhelmed by miserliness, they don't want to share that with others. So that is their own success. In the Dhamma, they have gained some success to some degree. But maybe they don't tell a person about a very special sutta that they read, very special discourse, something they've understood about these defilements maybe. So maybe someone learns this discourse about these defilements of mind that lead to a bad rebirth and how we need to remove these to practice for freedom from suffering. And if we learn these in detail, we can examine our own lives and understand how these defilements work. So a person learns this Dhamma and it's very useful for them, very helpful. But they think, oh, I don't need to tell other people about this. That's just for me. Right? That's miserliness in regard to Dhamma. Buddha considered that very evil thing. So, whatever success we gain in life, we should be happy to share that with others. Whether it's in the Dhamma, 
material possessions, right? So we practice generosity, we practice giving dana to help remove miserliness in relation to material things, right? By giving dhamma dana, by sharing the dhamma with others, we can practice to remove miserliness in regard to the dhamma. And the next defilement is deceit. Deceit means to hide one's bad qualities, one's own unwholesome qualities. One doesn't want to show them to others or let others know that they exist. It's hiding one's own faults. And the flip side of that is fraud, or another way to translate that would be um, what's the word? I remember the Pali word, but the English word is not coming to mind. So it, it means to, like, kind of as an act to show other people good qualities that one doesn't actually possess. So maybe. What can happen, uh, say, for example, a meditation retreat at the monastery, and a person's meditating, maybe they're not very skilled in meditation, but they want the other participants to think that they are really good meditators. So they maybe intentionally walk really slow, try to act like they're mindful in every posture, in every action. In fact, they're not. So they're like putting on a show for others, right? To show that they have qualities that really don't exist. That's what's meant by fraud here. Then next defilement of mind, Buddha explains obstinacy or stubbornness. So when one receives advice, good advice, maybe from a monk, be from one's parents, right? whoever it might be, one can receive good advice in life, but one doesn't want to accept that. One doesn't want to practice that. One's averse to accepting that. That's obstinacy, stubbornness. The next is rivalry. I can explain these in more detail, but we don't actually have time. Rivalry is to like to do tit for tat, to get even with someone, to try and outdo someone. It might be helpful to write notes about these if some of you aren't doing so, because then if you just read this translation with the one word uh, translations without understanding in detail the, the definitions, it can be difficult to, um, to see these in one's own life and to understand the deeper meaning. So rivalry here, like I said, like to try to get even with a person. Someone maybe wrongs you in some way and you remember that. And when a suitable occasion arises, you try and get back at that person. That's rivalry. Or another way it can manifest is to try and outdo another person. I don't know in Canada, but in, in the United States, there's an expression called keeping up with the Joneses. I don't know if you've ever heard that. That means someone's neighbor, they, maybe their neighbor gets a new car. They do some renovation. They make an addition to their house. And one tries to like come up to the other person's level, try to outdo the other person. So if a new per someone down the street gets a new car, we also need to get a new car. We need to get a more expensive car, more luxurious car than they have. I'd outdo the other person, right? Not just in material things, this can happen in the workplace, in terms of one pr profession, this can happen in the Dhamma, I gave the example of the meditation retreat. I tried to sit longer than everyone else. It's an expression of this defilement. 
rivalry and conceit. So the Buddha explains three types of conceit, right? Conceit, there's seyamana, sadhisamana, hinamana. Seyamana is to believe one's better than someone else. Sadhisamana to believe one's the same. And hinamana to believe one is inferior to another person. The different types of conceit. They're all based on ignorance, right? Because the notion of a self is a delusion itself. Then, based on that deluded notion of a self, one compares oneself with other people. Other also selfless people. Then arrogance. Arrogance is to have an inflated view of oneself. It's an expression of like seyaman, of the conceit that one is superior, but one thinks one is the extremely superior to another person. It's also defilement of mind. Next one is vanity or intoxication, another way to translate it. So the Buddha, when he was a bodhisattva, he got rid of three types of intoxication. Intoxication with youth, intoxication with health, intoxication with life, right? This is also, I think, based on delusion, this defilement. So when beings are intoxicated with youth, they don't see the reality that they will grow old one day. And all of the suffering, the decline in life that comes with old age, by not reflecting on that, they live as if they will be forever young, right? They'll always be a young person. And with that intoxication of mind, they engage in misconduct by body, speech, and mind, and accrue bad karma. Beings intoxicated with health, not understanding the reality that they will fall sick one day, could be tomorrow, could be many years from now, but they will fall very ill one day. Not understanding that reality, they live as if they will always be healthy, intoxicated by that, and they engage in misconduct by body, speech, and mind, accrue bad karma. And then beings are intoxicated with life. They don't see the reality that they will die one day, inevitably. Sabbe satta maranadhamma. All beings are subject to death. They don't see that reality. They are enveloped in delusion. There was a, I remember there was a popular song in the United States that had a refrain, you only live once. So that's, if you, I'm not telling you to look at that song, but that song is based on delusion. If you see the way, the, the lyrics are written. So to think in that way, to be intoxicated with youth, health, and life, to not reflect about the next life, to not reflect about the um, consequences of one's deeds, that one acquires karma by the way one acts, is a type of intoxication. It's a defilement of mind that leaves a bad destination after death. And the last one the Buddha explains of these 16 upakilesa, defilements of mind, negligence or heedlessness is another defilement rooted in delusion. So without thinking about the reality of death, to be lazy, to practice the Dhamma, to develop in good qualities, wholesome qualities, is to be negligent, to be heedless, to overcome this defilement, a very useful practice is to practice mindfulness of death. Maybe I think all of you have probably heard the Tana Sutra, Tana Sutra, where the Buddha explains five things that either a lay person or a, a monastic, a man or a woman should often reflect upon. They are Jaradam Mumhi Jaranganati Toti. I am subject to aging. I have not gone beyond aging. Vyadidam momhi vyadinganati toti. 
I am subject to sickness. I have not gone beyond sickness. Maranadhammamhi maranangarapitoti. I am subject to death. I have not gone beyond death. Sambehi me piehi manapehi nana bhavu vina bhavuti. All that is pleasant and agreeable to me, everyone, everything that is pleasant and agreeable to me, will separate from me. All of my relatives, my loved ones, my house, my possessions, even this body, I will separate from all of these things one day. Something the Buddha said that a disciple should often reflect upon. And then the Buddha enjoined his disciples to reflect upon the fact that they are owners of their karma, that they will become heir to whatever karma they do by body, speech, or mind. So by reflecting in this way, one can remove this defilement, negligence, heedlessness, laziness to practice the Dhamma and to get caught, just caught up in uh, sensual pleasures for years. So here the Buddha explains 16 defilements of mind. It's very important to learn these in detail, to understand them, to remember them, to recognize them in one's life. <clears throat> these defilements are repeated over and over again in the Buddha's discourses. They're very important. Then the Buddha says, knowing that covetousness and unrighteous greed is an imperfection that defiles the mind, a monk abandons it. Knowing that ill will, anger, resentment, contempt, insolence, envy, avarice, deceit, fraud, obstinacy, rivalry, conceit, arrogance, vanity and negligence are imperfections of the mind, defilements of the mind, a monk abandons them. So he sees, right, the defilements that give rise to suffering. Because he knows their nature, he abandons them. When a monk has known that covetousness and unrighteous greed is an imperfection that defiles the mind and has abandoned it, when he has known that all these defilements of mind are imperfections, their defilements, and he has abandoned them, then he acquires unwavering confidence in the Buddha thus. The Blessed One is accomplished, fully enlightened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime, knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened, blessed. He acquires unwavering confidence in the Dhamma thus. The Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One, visible here and now, immediately effective, inviting inspection, applicable to oneself, to be experienced by the wise for themselves. He acquires unwavering confidence in the Sangha thus, the Sangha of the Blessed One's disciples practicing the good way, practicing the straight way, the Noble Eightfold Path, practicing the true way for realization of the Four Noble Truths, practicing the proper way, that is, the four pairs of persons, the eight types of individuals, this Sangha of the Blessed One's disciples is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of reverential salutation, the unsurpassed field of merit for the world. So what are these three things to acquire unwavering confidence in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha? These are three of the four factors of stream entry, right? So the quality of a stream enter disciple is that they have unshakable confidence in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. Not because they believe the Dhamma as they have understood it, but they have realized the Dhamma to some degree, right? So they have an experiential knowledge of the Dhamma, not just a um, not just a belief. They've gone beyond mere faith. So now when the monk has given up, expelled, released, abandoned, and relinquished these defilements of mind in part, 
He considers thus, I am possessed of unwavering confidence in the Buddha. And he gains inspiration in the meaning, gains inspiration in the, in the Dhamma, gains gladness connected with the Dhamma. When he is glad, rapture is born in him. In one who is rapturous, the body becomes tranquil. One whose body is tranquil feels pleasure. In one who feels pleasure, the mind becomes concentrated. So this sequence, the Buddha explains how to develop samadhi, how to develop in meditation. So first, so he is, he's become a stream enter, so he has, he has that going for him. But in another sutta, for example, the Mahanama Sutta, we can understand Buddha um, teaches his disciples to practice Buddha Nusati, recollection of the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, recollection of the devas, one's virtue. So by reflecting on those wholesome objects, a gladness related to wholesome qualities arises in the mind. So normally we can try to experience happiness by um, enjoying sensual pleasure. So that's one kind of pleasure, one kind of happiness. Another kind is a happiness connected with the wholesome. These are connected with wholesome qualities, right? So when this monk reflects in this way, as a chain of conditions, causes and conditions, gradually his mind becomes concentrated. And he does the same related to Dhamma and Sangha. He considers thus, I am possessed of unwavering confidence in the Dhamma. And he gains inspiration in the meaning, gains inspiration in the Dhamma, gains gladness connected with the Dhamma. And when he is glad, rapture is born in him. Piti. In one who is rapturous, the body becomes tranquil. One whose body is tranquil feels pleasure. In one who feels pleasure, the mind becomes concentrated. So this is the sequence to practice if we want to develop in meditation, in samatha meditation, serenity meditation. So to gain samadhi, we can't just, a person can't just sit down and make a determination that they're going to gain samadhi. The necessary causes have to be there, right? Because this life is non-self, so we can't control things as we wish. Can't make the determination. Now I'm going to attain samadhi and then sit on the floor and make it happen. Doesn't work that way. We have to prepare the conditions in our lives. And here that's what's being explained. So when then he reflects in the same way about the sangha, how he has unwavering confidence in the sangha, and he practices to attain samadhi in the same way. Then he considers, the imperfections of the mind have in part been given up, expelled, released, abandoned, and relinquished by me. So he sees in himself that he has abandoned these defilements to some degree. And he gains inspiration in the meaning, gains inspiration in the Dhamma, gains gladness connected with the Dhamma. So he is happy about that wholesome state of mind. He is happy about his progress in practicing Dhamma. When he is glad, rapture is born in him. In one who is rapturous, the body becomes tranquil. One whose body is tranquil feels pleasure. In one who feels pleasure, the mind becomes concentrated. Monks, if a monk of such virtue, such a state of concentration, and such wisdom, eats alms food consisting of choice hill rice, along with various sauces and curries, even that will be no obstacle for him. Just as a cloth that is defiled and stained becomes pure and bright with the help of clear water, or just as gold becomes pure and bright with the help of a furnace, so too, if a monk of such virtue, concentration, and wisdom eats really exquisite, very delicious alms food, that's not an obstacle for him. When he has abandoned defilements to such a degree, here we can understand actually that the monk has likely attained the state of a non-returner. 
because for a non-returner, he's abandoned sensual desire. So in food, you find the five objects of sensual pleasure, forms, sounds, smells, flavors, and touches, right? That are all pleasant. So if a monk, if there's no obstacle for a monk from food, then he has abandoned sensual desire. He's become a non-returner. Then he practices the four Brahma Viharas. He abides pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth. So above, below, around, and everywhere, and to all as to himself, he abides pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. Then he practices in the same way, karuna, mudita, upekka. Right? So he's developing the four brahma viharas. Then he understands thus, there is this, there is the inferior, there is the superior, and beyond this, and beyond, there is an escape from this whole field of perception. When he knows and sees thus, his mind is liberated from the taint of sensual desire, from the taint of being, and from the taint of ignorance. So he's destroyed all the asavas by realizing the Four Noble Truths. When he, it is liberated, so when his mind is liberated in this way, there comes the knowledge it is liberated. He understands birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There's no more coming to any state of being. There's nothing more to be done to attain Nibbana. Monks, this monk is called one bathed with the inner bathing. So from the beginning of this discourse, the Buddha shows how a monk, after understanding these defilements and abandoning them, he becomes an arahant at the end, right? Now, on that occasion, the Brahmin, Sundarika Bharadvaja, was sitting not far from the Blessed One. So the Buddha said in the last sentence, this monk is called one bathed with the inner bathing. So he's taken a bath inside his body. I think that's the meaning. Like he's bathed his mind in a way. So. This Brahman was sitting there and he had a view that um, you can purify yourself by bathing in water. So people in India had this wrong view, right? People in India still have this wrong view. But does Master Gotama go to the Bahuka River to bathe? <laughs> so the Buddha explains all of this, about the defilements of mind, and he's concerned about the river. <laughs> Do you go to that river to take a bath? All of that may be so with these defilements, but do you bathe in this river? Why, Brahman, go to the Bahuka River? What can the Bahuka River do? Master Gotama, the Bahuka River is held by many to give liberation. Look at the wrong view, right? It is held by many to give merit, and many wash away their evil actions, their bad karma, in the Bahuka River. Then the Buddha teaches some very nice verses. Bahuka and Adikakka, Gaya and Sundarika too, Payag and Sarasati, and the stream Bahumati. A fool may there forever bathe, yet will not purify dark deeds. What can the Sundarika bring to pass? What the Payag? What the Bahuka? They cannot purify an evildoer, a man who has done cruel and brutal deeds. One pure in heart has evermore the feast of spring, the holy day. One fair in act, one pure in heart, brings his virtue to perfection. It is here, Brahman, that you should bathe. That means make one's mind pure to make yourself a refuge for all beings. And if you speak no falsehood, nor work harm for living beings, nor take what is offered not, with faith and free from avarice, free from miseriness, 
What need for you to go to Gaya? For any well will be your Gaya. Very beautiful verses, Buddha explained. To um, release him from that wrong view. When this was said, the Brahman Sundarika Bharadvaja said, Magnificent Master Gotama, Magnificent Master Gotama. Master Gotama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright what had been overthrown, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost, or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. So this is repeated over and over again in the discourses, right? This passage. Try to read it like carefully one time. It actually has a very beautiful meaning to show like a person who has understood the Dhamma to some degree, what kind of transformation has happened in their life. Revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost, or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. That's what it's like for him to understand the Dhamma in this way. He abandoned that wrong view. He was lost. He was in the dark. He has no idea. He thinks he can go and bathe in a river and get rid of his bad karma, right? So how, how different is the, real, the reality, right? The Buddha teaches. I go to Master Gotama for refuge and to the Dhamma and to the Sangha of monks. I would receive, and going forth under Master Gotama, I would receive the full admission. So he's asking to become a novice monk and a fully ordained monk now, right? And the Brahman Sundarika Bharadvaja received the going forth under the Blessed One, and he received the full admission. And soon, not long after his full admission, dwelling alone, withdrawn, diligent, ardent, and resolute, the Venerable Bharadvaja, by realizing for himself with direct knowledge, here and now, entered upon and abided in that supreme goal of the holy life, for the sake of which clansmen rightly go forth from the home life into homelessness. That is Nibbana, right? He attained Nibbana. He directly knew birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done, there is nothing more to be done to attain Nibbana. And the Venerable Bharadvaja became one of the Arahants. So that's where the discourse ends. The Buddha described how one should understand the defilements of mind that lead to a bad destination after this life, and how when the mind is not defiled, one can expect a good destination. And abandoning these defilements progressively, one can attain fruits of the path. And ultimately, when all the defilements are abandoned, a monk becomes an arahant who has attained Nibbana and will not be reborn again. So with that, we finished the discourse. Uh, we have a very short time for questions. It took uh, longer than I expected to teach the discourse. So anyone who has uh, any questions, please, you're invited to ask now. If um, Arjun... Amante. Okay. Uh, Bante, may I ask a question? Um, yes, yeah. Um, I understand that Buddha uh, mentioned of a lot of defilements in our mind. Um, most of this uh, definitely is in our conscious mind. I'm just wondering, so sometimes people would say, oh, I don't have anger. Oh, I, I, I don't, I, I abandon the jealousy or the revenge and everything. But then there, there might have some residual inside the unconscious mind because Bante may mention of Sigmund Freud so that connects me with the unconscious mind did Buddha mention anything about this or how do we make a correlation between the two philosophies thank you Bante well maybe we can understand for example I think an e the easiest way to understand it would be if a person has abandoned the hindrances and maybe attained the state of samadhi right so Anger doesn't obsess their mind. It can look like they don't have anger. But if they haven't attained any fruits of the path, right? Anger is still latent in their mind. They still have the latent tendency to anger. And it's the same thing with greed, right? So you can abandon the defilements temporarily. 
through meditation, through practicing samadhi. But to actually eradicate the defilements requires some realization to attain fruits of the path. So once returner removes hatred to some degree, removes desire to some degree, desire for sensual pleasures, a non-returner completely eradicates them. So what's important, I think, is association with noble friends, mindfulness, and wisdom. So in the, I think in Sri Lanka this happened, there was, maybe you've heard the story, a monk who thought he was an arahant. I think he had the eight meditative attainments. So he was very accomplished in samadhi. So it looks like to him that he doesn't have any defilements. But one of his students, who was an arahant, he knew that his teacher was deceiving himself, that he wasn't actually an arahant. So he went to his teacher and he's trying to free him from this wrong notion. And he had his teacher, he said, like, okay, well, he, he had psychic powers too. So this, you can see how people can be deceived. There's a huge development in the mind. He has psychic powers. He has eight meditative attainments, but he's not an arahant. So his student has him uh, create through psychic power an elephant in front of them. And then he says, okay, now have the elephant charge at him. And when the elephant's charging, then he got scared. <laughs> so he realized for himself, oh, okay, I'm not an arahant then. But until he, he saw the defilement arise in his mind, he was deceived. He, so it was, it was a latent tendency. With the, the asavas, the asavas are like deep-rooted defilements in our mind. But sometimes we might not see. So I think that example explains very, really clearly. He, he associated with a noble friend, his student, who helped him free himself from that wrong view. And then he was able to become an Arahant. So I think noble friends, mindfulness, wisdom uh, are helpful to understand that situation and remove the defilements. So, so Bhante, um, so does it mean that, um, sorry, sorry to follow up this question. Does it mean that uh, when we were born, okay, um, we, we, we have all of these defilements inside us. And then our task is to slowly abandon them. So does it mean that um, we were born bad? Sometimes people say, you know, by nature, we're born evil. Do, can we say that? Uh, I don't think we need to say that a, a person is evil or bad because then so the Bodhisattva in his last life he was born with the fireman right Prince Siddhartha but how exalted of a character was he even as a Bodhisattva so I don't think we need to think in terms of a person as like evil or good by nature, what we should think about is the defilements are evil by nature. Defilements are unwholesome by nature. And so even, a, even an infant, even a child, though maybe they have no notion of desire, they have the latent tendency to desire in them. They have the tendency to hatred in them, right? They have delusion in them. And so when they grow up, then those defilements can find manifestation in their actions. But before they can speak, how do they then speak unwholesome words? <laughs> how do they speak divisive words, right? They have no notion about those things at all. They can't even speak. So for a long time in sansara, our minds have been defiled. So by removing the defilements of mind, we can purify ourselves. I think that's the better way to think about it. Otherwise, if we, and even to think in terms of evil people, so who is the evil person, really? There's the five aggregates affected by clinging, the six elements, the six sense bases. Who is the evil person? So if we think in that way, I think it's, it's more helpful. Otherwise, we can actually, I think, Maybe even get angry thinking other people are evil.
I think best to think about the mental qualities instead. Thank you, Bhante. Any other question. questions? Yes, Dinu. Yes, uh, Bhante. So, um, great sutta. You know, a lot of, a uh, lot of like, I, I guess, like a lot of small defilements are mentioned in this sutta, right? But uh, you know, there's there's actually one big one which I thought might be good to include. Like, maybe maybe it's um, it's taking advantage of others, right? Like using others for your own benefit, right? Uh, what mm -hmm. would be the Pali word for that? That's a good question. Uh, because like I, I noticed like it's actually very, very common, right? Like a lot like even like a lot of people they do it, but they don't even realize it, right? Like even like a lot of friendships, relationships, all of that, like it's it's all self-centered. It's all for so some sort of self benefit or perceived yeah. self benefit, right? So like a, a lot of like even like breaking the five precepts and all that a lot of that actually revolves around not only like self-centeredness but s some perceived self-benefit right mm. so what would be the poly word for this kind of defilement i don't know off the top of my head a poly word that's exactly what you're describing but i think what you're describing is basically rooted in sakai ditti. Okay. Right. So one one is living with like immersed in this notion of a self. Mm -hmm. that, so so one takes the five aggregates affected by clinging and one of the four modes as either being identical with the self, as the self possesses the aggregate or is made up of the aggregate, or the self is in the aggregate or the aggregate is in the self so mm -hmm. when so sakaya ditti is like the main defilement that binds beings to the four bad destinations right mm -hmm. so after after removing that after removing that view of self-centeredness in relation to one's life the world then a being is not liable to be reborn in the bad destinations. So their actions are purified to the extent that they cannot perform an evil deed that would lead to rebirth in those bad destinations. Why? Because their life doesn't revolve around self-centeredness anymore. I so see I think one thing. That's like the maybe, and so Sakkai Ditti too is a manifestation of avidya, ignorance, delusion. So I think that's probably the basic defilement there. And then to use other people to one's advantage, there can be that other it's it's very broad work too. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean it doesn't doesn't really have to be people. It could be really any any living being, really. Mm -hmm. Right? Like for example, like just just two examples, right? Like, you know, there's some people who believe that okay, if we're gonna Okay, they believe that, okay, they can sacrifice some animal. And then, you know, they think that, okay, they go to heaven. So they're actually using some other being, right? They're taking away their happiness for some perceived self-benefit, right? Mm -hmm. And e even a lot of like, like, e even like, I, I guess it's, it's a lack of, I guess, metta, you can say, more of, more of a selfishness, lack of metta, lack of caring and understanding for the other person a lack of seeing the other person as a being with feelings and emotions so right it's all wrong view right wrong view yes yes so it's all but there's no it's all but there's no but like there's no word you can use or, or, or any any suttas or anything word. that that talk about this kind of thing I, there's one verse in the Kagavisana Sutta that uh, maybe you've read that sutta about the uh, Patika Buddhas in mm -hmm. Sutta Nipata. There's one verse, I think it's the last verse, that describes how people like associate with you because they have a selfish motive. 
So it's very rare to find friends who have unselfish motives. Therefore, mm -hmm. one should wander lonely as a rhinoceros one. So that's the first thing that comes to mind. But in terms of like a Pali word for that, I don't know of one off the top it of should, my head. It should should be, I guess, the opposite of. I'd say it's something to do with selfishness, self centeredness, or lack of metta. Because I remember, like in the in the Karaniya Metta Sutta, right? It says that we should have a boundless love towards everyone pretty much right mm -hmm. so beings who are short small tall big small whatever right rich poor etc etc right so i mean to do that we have to go beyond the self view anyways right let, so let i, I guess you this. so in noble eightfold path what does metta belong to if we say the three threefold training in Virtue, concentration, and wisdom. What does metta belong to? Should be wisdom. Wisdom, right? Yeah. So wisdom is to see reality of things, to see wholesome and unwholesome. So instead of a self-centered desire for oneself or maybe one's immediate family, caring and showing kindness for one's immediate family, the wise person understands as part of right view right based on right view mm -hmm. that all beings should be treated with kindness that anger is harmful to oneself and other beings yes, i think yes. related to wisdom in that way and then wisdom is opposed to what wrong view wisdom is counter to such counter kindness. to right 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 because yeah i mean the thing is the, the other question is like how do you how can you actually genuinely care about someone, right? If you have a Sakai Diti, it doesn't work out that way, right? It's like to actually truly care about someone else, you need to have removed that self-centered view, right? Well, after you remove the view, like you're established in that, so to speak, in, in caring for others. Right. right you've gone beyond that that self-centered perspective yeah because I, I like actually if you think about it like this actually leads to a lot of like again like using others for advantage discrimination and so, so many other things right right mm -hmm. like for example like you know it, it, like just just very so i i guess it's like a it's people do this all the time right it's like if, if they see like even between animals they always discriminate you know it's like they see a bunny, they react totally different to the way they see a frog, right? Even though they both might be innocent creatures, right? With, you know, with feelings and emotions and all that. But still, for example, because the bunny, it pleases the person's eye, right? Because it's fluffy and, you know, the, the, it, it looks nice, right? Where, and the, like the fur, it pleases, it pleases the body, right? Whereas a frog, it's a different story, right? It doesn't really please the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind of the people, right so people are actually just really chasing after those five and and also the thoughts in the mind right so we're not actually so again it's it's for self-benefit right it's because it pleases you therefore you i thought of a poly word for you okay <laughs> tanha tanha so tanha is very it's very broad simple example yes <laughs> simple word we can so there are, of course, many different ways that craving yes. can manifest itself, but everything you're describing is all the symptomatic it's of all, craving, right? Right, but there's no like, there's no specific word, right? I don't know sure. off the top of my head of the, the, that okay. self-centered behavior. Okay, okay. I, I've explained it. Right, explained okay. As I understand it. Okay, Bhante, and uh, another question. <laughs> Um, is there is there any any mention in the suttas of this loba and the dosa as being like two sides of a same coin, like as in you can't have one without the other? Because I I remember like I I read in some uh, it was in it was in a Zen Buddhist cone, right? It was talking about how greed and hatred are like it's like two sides of a coin. It's like a mountain and a valley, right? It's like when you dig when you dig a hole you automatically get a mountain. You can't have one without the other, 
something like that. Is that any any mention in the suttas uh, of something similar to that? Well, hmm. I mean, they, so let's think in this way. For a non-returner who's abandoned sensual desire, right? Mm -hmm. They've also abandoned uh, ill will, irritation. So with the abandoning of sensual desire, they also abandon that defilement, patiga. And we can also think in this way, to not receive pleasant things, one can get angry at that. Yes. So if a person doesn't give something that is desirable, then we can get angry at that person. Why? Because we have a desire for something pleasant, right? Yes, and they're not pleasing us. They're not giving us what we want. So again, Maybe it's that a, self-centeredness. A, child, kind of, yes. a little child who wants a certain present from their, their parents. They're in the grocery store. Maybe this is a common occurrence, right? And uh, they're crying for some item, some toy, some food. And their mother or father doesn't want to give that to them. And they get upset, right? The child gets angry because they're not receiving the, that pleasant object. So where it's explained like explicitly, like you're saying, I don't remember off the top of my head, the implicit connections there mm -hmm. in the discourses. Um, you can read, what was the, the sutta? In the Sangyutta Nikaya, Vedana Sangyutta, you can, it's fairly, it's a fairly deep sutta. You can read Duti Gelanya Sutta. It's about the three kinds of feelings. So normally for pleasant feeling, we have desire, right? Mm -hmm. For painful feeling, we experience aversion. And for neutral feeling, the underlying tendency to ignorance underlies that. That sutta explains how a monk abandons the underlying tendency to aversion toward painful feeling. And so the tendency to lust toward pleasant feeling is also described. All three are described in that sutta. That's a, a sutta that I recently read that the connection is implicit there. You can uh, maybe study that. Okay, Bhante. In the English translation, it would be like the second sutta on the sick ward. Okay. I think if I, I think it's the eighth sutta in Vedana Sangita. Okay. okay, so I got that. And Bhante, the first one was the Kagi Kagi Visana or Kagi Vesana Sutta, right? Kagi Visana Sutta. Kagi Visana Sutta. Okay. Any other questions? Namo Bande hmm? Bante, can I ask a question? Yes. Bante, can Bante explain about this? Uh, on page 120, it says uh, he understands that there is this, there is the inferior, there is the superior, and beyond there, is an escape from this whole field of perception. Yes, that's very, uh, uh, how do you say, it's very terse description there. Um, right. So I think we can understand it as it, here explaining the Four Noble Truths, because right after this paragraph, he abandons the taints, the asavas. So when he understands this, right. there, is, there is this, the, so in Pali Idang Dukkang, 
this is the truth of suffering. This is suffering. So he understands the noble truth of suffering. He understands, so what is the inferior? Is the defilements of mind, craving? Right. Is the noble truth of the origin of suffering. There is the superior, which I think we can understand as the noble eightfold path, because the noble eightfold path is the supreme thing among conditioned things that leads to Nibbana, the unconditioned thing. And beyond this, there is an escape from this whole field of perception. So with the attainment of Nibbana, with the attainment of Parinibbana, all perception ceases. Right? It doesn't arise again. There's no condition for the continued arising of perception. So I think this is a very terse description of the Four Noble Truths. And then after understanding in that way, after realizing the Four Noble Truths fully in that way, he, uh, his mind is freed from the asavas, from the taints. So this sutta describes, so the inferior describes all these defilements, right? All these defilements of mind are inferior because they lead to suffering. Yes, Bante. Yes. From this sutta, Bante, um, so in order to attain that concentrated mind, Bante, that at some level, the defilements should be eradicated. But of course, not all the defilements mentioned here. Correct, Bante? Well, in this sutta, the, like a, a gradual, a gradual developments explained. So first the monk becomes a stream enter, and then the discussion of samadhi, Buddha describes samadhi. But it's not necessary to become a stream enter to develop a state of samadhi, right? So in the Mahanama Sutta, the Buddha explains the recollection meditations and how those lead to samadhi. Right. I think this in this sutta it's a bit special because the monk is reflecting on his own realization of stream entry in order to develop samadhi, but that's not possible for most people. So, the if you look in the Mahanama Sutta in Anguttara Nikaya Book of Elevens, that explains clearly the recollection meditations and how, by cause and effect they gradually lead to the attainment of samadhi by developing that wholesome state of mind. Thank you, Mark. So if there are no more questions, we've gone over the time a little bit. We can, uh, I'm sorry, I, think, I see that there were maybe a lot in the chat. Oh, this was half an hour ago, but I'll answer it now. What is a Brahman? Jerry's asking. A Brahman is a, so in ancient Indian society, there were four main castes, four main classes. The aristocratic class, so like the warrior noble class that ruled the country. They were the Khatiyas. And then the Brahmins, who were like the priestly class. These two castes were the privileged castes in ancient Indian society, and they controlled the other classes. Then the third one was the Vesas, the merchants and agriculturalists, so the people who engaged in business, in farming, trade. They were the Vesas. And then the lowest of the four castes in the caste system were the Suddhas, who were like the laborers, the menial laborers. And even outside of this caste system, there were the outcasts. Even in India today, they're the outcasts. Who, they're considered so inferior in Indian society 
that they don't even have a place in the caste system. So the Brahmins were one of the privileged castes, and in the Buddha's time, they believed their superiority to come from divine providence. So they believed they were superior because they were born from Brahma or God. That was a predominant view of the Brahmin. But the Buddha reinterpreted the meaning of the word Brahman to be to mean an arahant, to mean a person, a holy man, a person who has become spiritually perfected. So we find both meanings in the discourses. Were these forecasts from Hinduism? Hinduism developed like the caste system as it is today later than it was in the Buddha's time. In the Buddha's time, there weren't like rigid, um, immovable caste systems. It was like taking shape, as I understand, in that time. But the main text that kind of like shackled Indian society within the caste system was the Laws of Manu, which was written later than uh, when the Buddha lived. But they are, they are part of Hinduism now, yes. So in, in the Buddha's teachings, if you read, for example, Vasetta Sutta, in many suttas the Buddha explains it actually. So the Buddha reinterprets the caste system. The caste system is determined based on one's birth, right? In Indian society, depend one is born into a certain caste. So the Brahmins saw a person's birth as determining their worth in society, but the Buddha reinterpreted that that a person's worth should be measured by their qualities, their wholesome qualities. So even if a Katya or a Brahmin, the two privileged castes, even a person from one of those castes, if they engage in unwholesome actions, then they are to be regarded as inferior because of their unwholesome actions, not just their birth. So the Buddha reinterprets a person's worth, way to measure a person, is based on their actions, not their birth. A very radical, um, very radical teaching for that time. 